right, so today we are looking at Genesis 48 to start off with. 48? 49. 49. Excuse me, I keep trying to do it. But Genesis 49, we see the blessings of the sons of Jacob. 1 and 2, what will befall the sons of Jacob in the last days? And Jacob called his son and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather, gather together and hear your, you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel your father. This wasn't Jacob's last significant this was Jacob's last significant act as a patriarch and as the heir to Abraham and Isaac. Here he prophesies blessings upon each son and he does it one by one. What shall befall you in the last days? Some of what follows are not so much blessings as they are prophecies regarding what God will do to the tribes in the future. That's right. This is the first conscious prophecy spoken by a man in the Bible. There were many prophecies announced by God, such as the promise of the triumph of the seed of a woman in Genesis, and others veiled prophecies by men, but this is the first declared prophecy th though through a man in the Bible. Now, something I found interesting was Jewish traditions tell us that as Jacob was about to bless his sons, he was ready to tell them the great secret concerning the end of time. But at that moment, the glory of God visited and left just as quickly taking all trace of knowledge with him. So he couldn't tell them anything about the end of time. Now, your sons of, of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. At the very beginning of the blessing, Jacob realized he was both Jacob and Israel. And his sons are e of each. This was a place of spiritual maturity, realizing both what God made him, Israel, and what he had to battle against. Jacob. So the first one he addresses is Reuben in 3 and 4. Reuben, you are my firstborn. You might and the beginning of, of my strength, the excellence of, my, of dignity, and the excellence of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. As the firstborn of the family, Reuben had claim to the inheritance right of the firstborn, but he forfeited it through pride. Because of Reuben's instability, the birthright was divided. Usually the firstborn was the spiritual and social leader of the clan, but among the sons of Israel, the rights of blessing, priesthood, and ruling authority were divided among brothers rather than being centralized in one. You shall not excel. The tribe of Reuben never did excel. No prophet, no judge, no king that we know of came from the tribe of Reuben. Reuben is an example of how the first we can, how the first example of how the first can end up being the last. That's right. And also on that note, as far as Reuben, if you look at Reuben, Reuben and Jacob were so much alike yeah. in the beginning. Yep as far as that was the way Jacob was when he first started out. Right. All right. So next he talks to Simon and Levi. Simon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be, un be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Simon and Levi, both brothers, they are the second-born son, Simon, and the third-born son, Levi, received the same words from the same evil deed. They were instruments of cruelty when they wiped out all the men of Seshem in retaliation for the rape of their sister Dina. Right. Right. 
Jacob perhaps in weakness did not did nothing at the time except register a small self-centered complaint. Yet he and the Lord remembered this event. This illustrates the principle that the sins of our past can come back and haunt us. Even when forgiven, they may carry consequences we must face for a lifetime. Cursed by their anger. The real problem with Simon and Levi was their anger. Their anger was sin because it was rooted in self-will. The Bible speaks of godly anger and, and an ungodly anger. Often the difference between a godly and righteous anger and an ungodly anger is self-will. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. The prophecy of dividing and scattering turned out to be a curse for Simon. The tribe of Simon was the weakest numerically of the twelve and shared an allotment of land with Judah. The tribe of Simon became small during the wilderness wanderings. They started out from Egypt being the third largest tribe. Now think about that. They were the third largest tribe. But and exactly. And, and but some 35 years later, just 35, it ain't even like the 400 that a lot of them have done. In 35 years, at the second wilderness census of Israel, 63% of the tribe perished. Wow. And they became the smallest tribe within 35 years. That is amazing. Now, as far as Levi... The scattering of his tribe was because they were the biblical tribe uh, or the priestly tribe. Yep. And that's why they got scattered the way they did. Exactly. Keepers in the tabernacle. Right. The prophecy of dividing and scattering became a blessing for right. Levi. Right. Because of the faithfulness of this tribe during the rebellion of the golden calf, which we see in Exodus, it was scattered as a blessing throughout the whole nation of Israel. They received no large tract of land, for the Lord was their inheritance, not the land. So both Simon and Levi were scattered, but one was a blessing and one was a curse. Happy is the, that man who, though he begins with a dark shadow resting upon him, so lives as to turn even that shadow into a bright sunlight. Levi gained a blessing at the hands of Moses one of the richest blessings of any tribe. <clears throat> 8 through 12, we see Judah, the scepter shall not depart from him. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's wealth. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Unto Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the, be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Judah wasn't a completely exemplary character. He suggested a profit motive in getting rid of Joseph. He did not deal faithfully with his daughter-in-law Tamar, and he had sex with her as a prostitute. But he showed good character when he interceded and offered himself as a substitute for Benjamin. I still say that that is a big thing that saved him. Overall, this blessing is an example of the richness of God's grace to the undeserving. You are he whom your brothers shall praise. Each of these referred to the ruling position Judah will have among his brethren. He inherited the leadership aspect of the firstborn's inheritance. This leadership position among his brothers 
meant that the eventual kings of Israel would come from Judah and that the Messiah, God's ultimate leader, would eventually come from the tribe of Judah. In Revelations 5.5, 5, Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's right. The firstborn normally had two rights. First, he became the leader of the family, the new patriarch. Second, he was entitled to a double share of the inheritance, receiving twice as much as any other of the brothers. Until Shiloh comes, the leadership prophecy took some 640 years to fulfill in part with the reign of David. First of Judah's dynasty of kings, the prophecy took six, some 1,600 years to completely fulfill in Jesus. So, Shiloh is Jesus. Yeah. So, so if you do the math on that, from Judah down to Jesus, that's 2,040 years. Because you have 640 to fulfill the reign of David. Then it took, for it to get to Jesus, it was another 1,600 years. So that's 2,040 years. And Jesus is referred to as the Shiloh, the name meaning he whose right it is or to whom it belongs, and a title anciently understood to speak of the Messiah. From David until the Herods, a prince of Judah was head over Israel. Even Daniel in captivity. The promise was that Israel would keep the scepter until Shiloh comes. Even under their foreign masters during this period, Israel had a limited right to self-rule until A.D. 7. At that time, under Herod and the Romans, their right to capital punishment, a small but remaining element of their self-governance, was taken away. At that time, the rabbis considered it a disaster of unfulfilled scripture. Seemingly, the last vestige of the scepter had passed from Judah, and they did not see the Messiah. Reportedly, rabbis walked the streets of Jerusalem and said, Woe unto us, for the scepter has been taken away from Judah, and Shiloh has not come. Yet God's word had not been broken. Certainly, Jesus was alive then. Perhaps this was the very year he was 12 years old and discuss God's word in the temple with the scholars of his day. Perhaps he impressed them with his understanding of this very issue. Now, could you imagine that? Twelve-year-old. Yeah. 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 Talking to the scholars. Is that yeah. 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 It's just amazing when you think about it. No, for sure. Finding his donkey. This blessing was also contained in a description of Judah's material abundance. Judah's land was great wine-growing country. Now you have Zebulun. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea, and he shall become a haven for ships. And as and his borders shall adjoin Sidon. Zebulun, Jacob now skipped the birth order, moving to the tenth born and the ninth born sons, but keeping his focus on the sons born of Leah. The tribe of Zebulun was noted for its faithfulness to David, supplying the largest number of soldiers to David's army of any single tribe. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, of Zebulun, there were 50,000 who went out to battle, except in war with all weapons of wars, stout-hearted men who kept, could keep ranks. And that's from First Chronicles. Yep. He shall become a haven for ships. The tribe of Zebulun seems to have settled the piece of land sitting between the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee. Literally, shall dwell by the havens of the sea can be translated looking towards the sea. Zebulun did look to the sea, both to the east and the west. Now, one of the things I told you, Dave, this morning when uh, we were going, when I was doing my reading, is that 
Jacob here as he's going through giving his blessings and or prophesizing that if you read this here and then flip over to Joshua when they got to the promised land, he's more or less prophesizing yeah. where they're going to be staying at. And as what far they're as the tribes of breakdown yep, and what they were doing. He's already divided the land. Yep. Yeah. And it, it was amazing. It, it just come to me today, you know, yeah. looking at it that way and going back over it. Did you do verse 12? I don't remember you doing verse 12. Yeah. 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 I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah, that was part of the um, Judah 8 to 12. Yeah. I, don't know. I didn't write it. All right, now we are looking at 14 and 15. Ishchar, a strong donkey. Ishchar is a strong donkey lying down between two birds. He saw the rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulders to bear a burden, and he became a band of slaves. Ishchar was a large tribe, third in size according to the Numbers 26 census and became a band of slaves. Because of their, sli their size and abundance, they were often targets of oppressive foreign foreigners who would come in with great armies who would put, take them and put them into servitude. Leopold once said, the meaning seems to be the laugh that Ishishar was strong, but was docile. And lazy. Well, he, now one of the things that I read in the commentary is that this, this tribe here was kind of like a backbone because they were the servants and they served more than they did anything else. Well, yeah, and and that's like Leopold saying, but he says that they were lazy because they were they would enjoy the good lands assigned to him. They were content being right doing just, just where what they, they had were, to do. <laughs> but they would not strive for it. Right. Therefore, eventually, he would be pressed into servitude and the mere bearing of burdens for his master. Sixteen and eighteen. Dan shall judge his people. As one of the tribes of Israel, Dan, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path, that bites the horse's heels, so that its rider shall fall backwards. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. The tribe of Dan did judge his people. They supplied one of the most prominent of the judges, Samson. Dan was a troublesome tribe. They introduced to introduce idolatry into Israel. Jeroboam set up one of the, his idolatrous golden calves in Dan, and later Dan became the center of idol worship in Israel. So they were all kinds of messed up. They didn't go over the river, did they? Who's Dan? Yeah, they didn't cross the river, did they? Yeah, they did because... Uh that wasn't one of the tribes to say that. It was Reuben and uh, Gad. Manasseh. Manasseh. Yeah, because it's later when Dan goes and becomes the center of idol worship in Israel, that's in Amos 8, 14. Dan led, led a rebellion. Yeah. He, he was rebellious. Some think the serpent, by the way, refers to the idea that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan. Dan is left out of the listing of tribes regarding the 144,000 in Revelation. But Dan is the first tribe listed in Ezekiel. Millennial roll call of the tribes. This is a remarkable sign of God's redemption. Now, speaking of Dan and him being uh, rebellious and you saying what you did about some scholars think that the Antichrist is going to come right. Dan. I can see that, but do you know, if you really think about it, every one of us come from one of these tribes. Oh, yeah. We oh, all yeah. come from one of these tribes. Which tribe are we from? Oh, I, I mean, 
Yeah. It's something to think about. Yeah. Yep. And it says, I waited for your salvation, O Lord. The Hebrew word for salvation is Yahweh. At that at this point in the prophecy, when Jacob was near death, he called out for God's salvation. Knowingly or not, Jacob called out for Jesus. Nineteen, Gad. Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. The tribe of Gad supplied many fine troops for the later king of Israel, David. In the days of Jeremiah, among other times, foreign armies oppressed Gad. Yet victory would be his in the end. You know, he really don't say a whole lot about Gad, does no. he? <laughs> you tell them to do tests. No. The gathering. The gatherings, yeah. And you remember the story about Jesus and the I am Legion? Legion? Yeah. And he put the demons into the pigs? Yeah. Right. The gatherings raised forth. Yeah. And they were shunned by the Israelites. Yeah. But but I'm saying right here, yeah, when he's doing the blessings, they don't have a whole lot to say to him. No, they were. I think, I, I think God gave Jacob a whole lot of insight that he knew. Like you said, he took a, a lot of it from him. But he knew what tribe was going to do what, even right. in the future. I.e. Gad, the Gadarenes, raising pigs, you know? Yeah. And which was an abomination is what they said. Now we'll look at Asher in 20. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 33, Moses again took up the prophecy regarding Asher. Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers, and let him dip his foot in oil. Apparently, the land eventually occupied by Asher was good enough to bring not only the necessities, but also luxuries. Now, 21 is Naphtali. Naphtali. <clears throat> Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Naphtali's land was in key portion near the Sea of Galilee, the region where Jesus did much of his teaching and ministry. Now, you, in Matthew 4, 12 through 16, it talks a lot about him, about that tribe. Or the Sea of Galilee. Right. He uses beautiful words because so much of the ministry of Jesus took place in the region of Naphtali. This was fittingly said of him. And that's all that was said. Mm -hmm. Now 20 through to, 22 through 26, a fruitful bough. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall the archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong. By the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, from there is the shepherds, the stone of Israel. By the God of your Father, who will help you, and by the Almighty, who will bless you, with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, Blessings of the breast and of the womb, blessings of your father, have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. This was both a description of Joseph's life and a personal blessing concerning his descendants. In a sense, Joseph's tribe was already blessed when his sons received their blessing in Genesis 48. There it goes. <laughs> kind of threw me off for a second. This description of Joseph as a fruitful bough by a well speaks of his being well watered. Go ahead. Uh, and provided for his deep and real relationship with God. 
the main point in Joseph's character was that he was a clear and constant fellowship with God, and therefore God blessed him greatly. He lived to God and was God's servant. He lived with God and was God's child. Though Joseph was shot at and hated, he was still fruitful bow. This was because the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. The idea is that God's hands were on Joseph's hands, giving him strength and skill to work the bow expertly. God was there even when Joseph didn't know it. Joseph was certainly blessed in his posterity. His tribes were some of the most populous. In, his, in this sense, he received the material blessing, the double portion aspect of the inheritance of the firstborn. Jacob could say this was because he was, for much of his life, a scoundrel. Now, at the end of his days, he saw just how God, good God was to him. He was forgiven much and loved much. In his words about Joseph, Jacob listed five great titles from, for God. These titles show that Jacob did come to an understanding of who God is. The mighty God of Jacob, the shepherd, the stone of Israel, the God of your father, and the Almighty. Now, 27 talks of Benjamin. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. This was a tribe with a reputation for fierceness. To see the great extent of this, look at Ehud, or Judges, Saul, and Paul. The cruelty of the tribe in general is seen in Judges 19 and 20. There's a tribe of Jim Benjamin that had uh, the dad wouldn't let the daughter in the house. And I can't remember that, what the, all the story is about. She went out and he disapproved and he wouldn't let her in. And the men of the town took advantage of her uh, horribly. Yeah. And he remember he cut her to pieces and distributed her all around. Yeah. yeah. Was, Horrible truck. Twenty-eight. <coughs> this is where Jacob concludes his blessing. All of these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them, and he blessed each one according to his own blessing. Some of the things mentioned regarding this tr these tribes may seem a bit cloudy, but only because we may not know their exact fulfillment until the age to come. Each son and each tribe that would come from them had their own calling and destiny. Yet the remarkable promise remained that they would survive and grow into significant tribes without one perishing during the century to come in Egypt. Jacob's death, 2932. Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people, bury me with my fathers in the caves that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Marm, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite, Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heath. Jacob was confident that his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham continued to live in the eternal state that he would be gathered to them. Though Jacob was now in Egypt, he knew he was not an Egyptian. He was the son of the promise and an heir of God's covenant with Abraham. And he asked to be buried in the land promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by covenant. Egypt was filled with magnificent tombs, and because of the respect Jacob had, he could have been buried like a pharaoh. But he wanted to be buried in an obscure cave in Canaan, 
because Canaan was the land that was promised. 33. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up in the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. This ends the life of the last of the great patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet the work and plan of God did not end. It continued through men and generations to come. There are said to be three basic attitudes towards death. Among the ancient, ancient Greeks, they held to what can be called the death-accepting view. Our modern world is sold out to a death-denying approach. The biblical approach is the death-defying attitude. That's all I have for that. Fifty is a lot quicker. You know, you remember we had discussions about you know, it won't take long mm -hmm. about Joseph couldn't receive the identity as a tribe because he had become so much of an Egyptian. In uh, chapter forty nine, <coughs> where it refers to the blessing of Joseph, is really uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. Right. That when he refers and he says Joseph, that's what he's meaning. Those two sons, that's where the blessing is, because they become their own tribe. Right. Okay. Joseph never becomes a tribe. No. Okay. So what you got to remember when it says he blessed Joseph, he's talking about the two boys. He's exactly. talking about his sons. Right. Yeah. All right. So in fifty one through three, Jacob is embalmed and mourned. Then Joseph fell on his face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. That so, is wrong. You know that, right? Yeah. The Jewish people don't. They don't embalm. They don't embalm. They're supposed to be buried, not even a wooden box. They were supposed to be naturally put back to the earth as part, part of the cycle of body. Yeah, the ashes to ashes, dust yeah. to dust. Yeah. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him. For such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned him seventy days. The passing of Jacob in the presence of its son was a deeply moving and dramatic scene. Jacob was mourned for seventy days among the whole nation of Egypt. A royal mourning period in Egypt was seventy-two days. Jacob was obviously... A great honored man. Four through six. And when the days of the mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made, made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying in my grave which I, have, I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear. The fact that Joseph made his initial request, not directly to the ruler of Egypt, but spoke to the household of Pharaoh, is the kind of detail that would be noted by true witness of the events, and not made up by a storyteller. Joseph explained the solemn promise his father required of him. Pharaoh gave him the liberty to keep the promise and bury in Israel in Canaan. 7 through 11. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of the house and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers, his father's house, only their little ones, their flocks, and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with both chariots and horsemen, and it was, very, was a very great gathering. Then they came to the, to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamination. 
he observed seven days of mourning for his father. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Adad, they said, This is a deep mourning of the Egyptians. Therefore, it is, its name was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. This was a dramatic burial. The entire clan gathered together to pay tribute to the man who was the last link with the patriarchs. The life of this man's grandfather overlapped with the sons of Noah. This was no doubt a day of rededication of the sons of Israel to the God of Israel, the God of the great covenant made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their dedication to God of Israel would be tested over the next many hundred years, but would survive. 12 through 14. So his sons did for him just as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of, of the field of Machpelah before Mam, or Mam, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite as property for the burial place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers and all who went up with him to bury his father. Jacob's son had often oppressed and they disappointed him in life. They were careful to honor him in his death. This was the cave purchased by Abraham, Abraham the only part of the land of Canaan that Abraham held a deed. This was the burial place for Sarah, Abraham, Isaac, Rebecca, and Leah. You remember the transaction? Yep. That memory? Yep. Was what's his name? Ephron the Hittite and his captain. Mm -hmm. Remember that story? Yeah. yeah okay. Fifteen. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Now, here they go again. Here they go There's again. Paranoia. Paranoia creeping in. They, they have a tough time. The brothers feared that perhaps Joseph would turn on them after Jacob's death. Knowing human nature, this was a certain possibility. Here they freely acknowledged all the evil which they did. What they worried about was justice. They feared righteous retribution. Joseph, with his high status and prestige in Egypt, was certainly capable of bringing this to them. 16 through 18. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. That was the prophecy of them. Yep. This story was probably, kind of could have been thought of as made up. That it, it maybe it didn't go exactly as it was said there, but they didn't feel they had a moral right to ask Joseph for mercy, since they sinned against him so greatly. So they put the request for mercy in the mouth of their father mm -hmm. to do it for them. That's the part of being, you know. So Joseph probably wept because it seemed that his brothers thought so little of him that they doubted his character so greatly. Mm -hmm. They backed up their plea mm -hmm. for mercy with a genuine display of humility where they laid on their face. 19 through 21. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is, it is this day, 
to save many people alive. Now therefore do not be afraid. I will pro provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph first understood he was not in the place of God. Right. It wasn't his job to bring retribution upon his brothers. If the Lord chose to punish them, he would find the instrument to do so. For a human perspective, Joseph had the right and the ability to bring that retribution upon his brothers. But he knew God was God, and he was not. Such retribution was God's place, not Joseph's. As for you, you meant evil against me. Joseph did not romanticize the wrong his brothers did. He plainly said, you meant evil against me. Although this was true, it was not the greatest truth. The greatest truth was God meant it for good. Every Christian should be able to see the overarching and overruling hand of God in their life. To know that no matter what evil man brings against us, God can use it for good. Right. Joseph did not have the text of Romans 8.28, but he had the truth of it. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Sadly, many of us who have the text do not have the truth. <coughs> there was an old minister who had a unique gift to minister to the distressed and discouraged. In his Bible, he carried an old bookmark woven of silk threads into a motto. The back of it, where the threads were knotted and tied, was a hopeless, tangled mess. He would take the bookmark out and show the troubled person this side of the bookmark and ask them to make sense of it. They never could. Then the pastor would turn it over, and on the front were, the, were white letters against a solid background saying, God is love. When events in our life seem tangled and meaningless, it is because we can only see one side of the tapestry. That's right. To save many people alive, this was immediate good in this situation. If this large family did not come to Egypt and live, it would have perished in the famine. Had the family barely survived, it would have assimilated into the Canaanite tribe surrounding it. Only by coming to Egypt could they be preserved and grow into a distinct nation. As said before, if Joseph's brothers never sold him to the Midianites, then Joseph would have never gone to Egypt. If he didn't go to Egypt, he would have never been sold to Potiphar. Potiphar's wife would have never accused him. He would have never went to prison. He would have never met the baker and the butler. He would have never interpreted their dreams, then turned around and interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. If Joseph had never interpreted the dreams, he would have never became prime minister, second in Egypt only to Pharaoh. That's right. If he had never become the prime minister, he would have never been able to save all the people keep the terrible famine at bay. Mm -hmm. And if he that had never happened, they would have all died from the famine. Mm -hmm. And if they had all died from the famine, then guess what? We wouldn't be here. The Messiah would not have came. We wouldn't be here either. And if Jesus never came, then we are all dead in our sins and without hope in this world. Because Joseph trusted the overarching hand of God, even all the evil that came upon him through his brothers, he showed the love and compassion to them he did. Joseph's love for his brothers was, sh was shown not only in feelings and words, but also in a practical action. He actually did provide for his brothers and their families. 22 through 24, the death of Joseph. I don't know about y'all, but when I got to this part, I just kind of went, oh, 
Yeah. I knew he had to die, yeah. but it was just kind of like, oh. I know. It, it's <laughs> like you feel this kind of sadness. Or yeah. You feel there's a lot of emotion there. It is, and I, I did. I just kind of went, oh, why? You knew he had to, but yeah. you didn't want to see it. Yeah. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation, the children of Machar, the sons of Manasseh, Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. His long life was further evidence of God's blessing on blessing on Joseph's life, as was seeing Ephron's children to the third generation. The hardship of his life did not diminish God's ultimate blessing upon him. Joseph was the first was the human agent most responsible for bringing his family to Egypt. Yet he knew that because of the covenant God had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this would not be their resting place. They were, would, were headed eventually back to Canaan. 25 and 26, And Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall gather, carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. And they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. According to this passage, and Hebrews 11.22, Joseph was n never buried. His coffin laid above the ground for, for the 400 or so years until it was taken back to Canaan. It was a silent witness for all those years that Israel was going back to the promised land, just as God said. Joseph lived a life of dramatic faith, yet in the end, this is how he was remembered in the Hebrews 11 Museum of Faith. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. This was faith because it trusted God's promise to his people. It was faith because it was because it knew where God's people belonged, because it looked to the future, and because it proclaimed God's faithful promise in any way possible, even through a dead man's bones. <laughs> I never thought about that. <coughs> Joseph being put out, out in as a line. monument, if you will, mm -hmm. as a reminder that you're not going to stay here. That's right. I never thought about I that. That's good. That's a good point. I never thought. Mm -hmm. You know something else I, I just thought about? You know, the Jewish people didn't believe in embalming, and that was an Egyptian uh, right, uh -huh. and actually that's pretty pagan. Yeah, to be embalmed is what it is, and I never thought about it because you're actually your body is separated from your organs. Right, is what it is. But I, I never thought about that the aspect of embalming. It was just a natural thing that was passed around, mm -hmm. and I never considered that. Then. You're better off being buried in a pine box and not being embalmed yeah. put in a white sheet and let go. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. It's something to think about. And it says, look, my finishing statements here is, you shall carry up my bones from here. This promise was fulfilled some 400 years later when Israel left Egypt. This command showed that Joseph's heart was in the promised land. It also proved him to be a man of great faith, trusting in things not yet seen. All during that time, when a child of Israel saw Joseph coffin and asked what it was there for and why it was not buried, they could be answered because the great man Joseph did not want to be buried in Egypt, but in the promised land God will one day lead us to. Some promises of God take a long time to fulfill, and we must persevere in trusting God. George Muller was a remarkable man of faith who ran orphanages in England 
in a sermon preached when he was 75 years old, he said 30,000 times in his 54 years as a Christian, he received the answer to a prayer on the same day he prayed it. But not all his prayers were answered so quickly. He told of one prayer that he brought to God about 20,000 times over more than 11 years, and he still trusted God for the answer. I hope in God I pray on and look for the answers. Therefore, beloved brethren and sisters, go on waiting upon God and go on praying. Joseph died looking forward to God's unfolding plan of redemption, and that is where the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, ends. It concludes looking forward to the continuation of God's eternal loving, wise plan. Well, you know, Joseph being done the way he was done is also a symbolism of we're, we're not residents of this world, we're residents yep. of another world. So therefore, Joseph being set aside is one of our faiths is when we die, we know we're going to heaven. And Joseph's body sitting there for 400 years. Right. That's well, the thing. Guess what? Man. Guess what? No, guess what? What happens when you die? Your body goes in the ground, your spirit goes back to God. Yeah. What happens at the rapture? Your body reunites because you get the uh, sanctified body, uh, glorified body. So that's telling us, that's pre-prophecy right there of what's going to happen to you or us. Mm -hmm. Your body's going to go in the ground and your spirit goes back to being God. Well, and think about how many got led to God because his mm -hmm. body sat there for 400 years. That's another, that's a, a token, what they call a token. And a token is something that's set out for people to know, a remembrance. Yeah. Yeah. What it is. And that's like a license plate on my truck. Yeah. It's the same thing. And that's what we should do. Like Charlie's uh, uh, Thank You Jesus. It does the same thing. The other thing I want to bring out is uh, the Hebrew word for Coffin is ark. Isn't yeah. that something? Yeah. yeah. Ark. Is it not a job? What? Is this coffin called the ark of God? I don't understand. Is this coffin called the ark that was carried? Yeah, when it carried it, but then it, it wasn't carried like the ark. <coughs> Remember how the ark was carried? You and couldn't touch the ark. You couldn't touch the ark. You could touch Joseph's his coffin. But coffin is the same thing as ark. That's why it is, and when you think about that, and that's why. And you know what is an ark? An ark is a, a safety. Yeah. You know, it, it, and the storms of life. Yeah, an ark conveys you. This and this. An ark conveys you from one place to another place. Yeah. So what does that mean? Yeah. You leave an ark going ahead. That's, I thought that was so awesome. That is. Yeah. That really is. All right, you want to close us with prayer? and yeah. uh, stop the Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you did give us another opportunity that we can study your word. And once again, Lord God, in these last two chapters of Genesis, we found some little jewels that we didn't know. And we love that, Lord God, when you give us that illumination and give us the understanding and the excitement of reading your word. We thank you, Lord, for their many blessings, Lord God, and I actually bless all that was here and the ones that couldn't be here, Lord. And comfort those ones that are sick that can't be here. And we thank you, Lord God, for everything you do for us. And keep us safe in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to continue the Exodus, or are we going to go to Revelation?